The Holy Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13, beginning with verse 18. Jesus asked, What is the realm of God like? And to what should I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that someone took and tossed in the garden. And it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air made nests in its branches. The Gospel of the Lord. This is not the only time Jesus tries to explain what the realm of God is like. The mustard seed analogy alone is told by Luke twice, by Matthew twice, and by Mark once. If we look at all five of these mustard seed mentions, we know that besides the fact that a tiny seed uh, scattered grows into a huge tree in which many birds can make a home, we also know that if one has faith the size of a mustard seed, one could order a mulberry tree to uproot itself and make a new home in the sea. And possibly the most well-known reference is that if one has faith the size of a mustard seed, one can move mountains. It is a parable that is easy to discount. By faith alone, we can uproot trees or move mountains. That must be hyperbole, right? Well, let's take a look. When Jesus gave his disciples the charge to preach the gospel through all the world, there was somewhere around 200 million people on earth. Today, there are 7.9 billion people on the planet. 2.5 billion identify as Christians. What's interesting is that any farmer who has ever had a mustard seed in her field will tell you that a mustard seed tree wreaks havoc with their crops, as do all the birds that such a tree attracts. The parable of the mustard seed, of course, is a metaphor for what we call the church. I was in Prague, France last week, and I visited St. Pierre Cathedral, a church that dates back to 1606. It's funny to think that our contemporary churches are connected to churches such as that one that have stood the test of time and that contain statues of Jesus so precious they were buried during the war so as not to be damaged then dug up and restored after the cacophony of war was silenced. This huge institution, whose members have wreaked havoc in one another's lives like the birds that gather in a mustard tree, this church that began with a handful of believers and has grown to 45,000 denominations worldwide, is often as corrupt as it is holy. It is as beautiful and loving as it is troubling and hurtful. And while it is easy to get incensed when we hear about the way the church has taken advantage of people or been led astray, it shouldn't be that surprising because the church in the end is made up of people the very people who would crucify its savior, the very people for whom that savior died. And when one looks at all that Christianity has done throughout the ages, both good and bad, it is a reasonable comparison to say that by our faith, we really have moved mountains. In its best moments, we the people who are part of the church have also fed the hungry, visited the imprisoned, petitioned governments for acts of justice on behalf of those being unjustly persecuted. We have given hope to the hopeless and forgiveness to the regretful. Church buildings have provided shelter from the storms of life for those walking the road of sobriety and those struggling with other forms of addiction 
It has become a, a literal shelter for those without homes and those whose, whose homes have been destroyed by war. And for 80 years, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services have welcomed more than 500,000 refugees and immigrants from around the globe, many of whom are members of our churches today. And since 1945, Lutheran World Relief has partnered with impoverished communities and churches to provide humanitarian aid and help in the wake of famine, drought, and war. In our opening video today, you saw some photos from the early days of this church from which B lifted sprang. That is King of Kings Lutheran Church in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You saw the humble sign that marked the spot on which this congregation would build a place of faith, hope, and love with a mission focused on working for justice, learning and adapting together as an expression of humility and offering what we were able to give to those in need. Right now, the church is at a crossroads in time. We are experiencing another reformation. Church attendance has been in decline for years and many churches had to close their doors for lack of membership. This service marks the beginning of year three of Be Lifted, which was created in response to the limitations of gathering imposed on us by COVID-19. And while we are all reasonably willing to participate in this new version of the church, in which we gather from separate places together online, Many have lost their zeal for doing church this way or any way, even though Be Lifted has the ability to include far more people than in-person worship if we are able to stay the course doing the work to which we have been called as followers of Jesus, and that is to take the gospel to all the world. At the same time, we are beginning to gather in person again on the second and third Sundays of the month. These services are live streamed, though even the best live stream leave, leaves those watching from afar feeling a little bit left out. Our challenge today is to muster the enthusiasm to continue being and doing the work of the church even though we are tired. And Lord, are we tired, even though we are disheartened, even though we are legitimately traumatized from all we have witnessed and lived through together. Maybe that's what this entire series on grief in the season of Lent was about. It has been a reminder of how different the faces of grief can look, anger, rage, depression, apathy, guilt, intolerance, blame, either or thinking, distance, silence. But the truth is grief is not something we move through and are done with. Grief is part of what it means to be alive. The grief we are carrying today may lessen but then come back in force at the next loss. And the grudges we carry today toward people who are also traumatized are ours to either nurse or in the name of grace, choose to put down for good. And so as we move forward together into the numerous decisions of what the church will look like now, what traditions we will continue, what traditions we will set aside, where and how and when we will worship, and how our faith will continue to grow into a tree under which more and more people can take shelter from the storm. I appeal to you to remember the essence 
of what it means to follow Jesus. Following Jesus, more than anything, is about loving one another. We show this love when we consider the actions of one another in the best possible light and interpret miscommunications and disagreements as part of what it means to be in community with one another. We show our love when we show up for one another, both online and in person. We show love when we resist the temptation to retreat permanently into our comfortable spaces and remember the joy of building and being community together. We show love to God and to one another when we continue to be faithful, especially when it is hard to do so. We show love to one another when we really value those we meet online and those we can't wait to worship with together in person. This is what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus in 2022. People of God, I know you are tired. I know you are sad and worried and grieving. I know you may disagree with decisions that have been made that affect you. And those decisions might have left you angry. This is all part of war. And after, and often during a war, people that endure it and fight it together do one of two things. They either separate because they can't bear looking at someone who reminds them of the pain they have been through, or they bond even more closely together. My hope is that what we, that is exactly what we will do. We will draw nearer to God and nearer to one another. And in this, we will find our healing. God is faithful, even at a time of war, a pandemic, a drought, famine, and the largest refugee crisis this world has ever known. God continues to work through God's people to bring life and love and hope to all the world. Someone asked me recently, what was your favorite part of France? Oddly, it was this story. I was walking down the street of Paris late morning, just before I left and I was passing by a fruit market, the kind that had um, the fruit outside the store and inside. Standing by the produce was clearly the owner of the store, uh, talking to some customers wearing a white apron. And on the other side of the door was um, dog food, bones, bags of bones, all kinds of things for dogs. The owner must have been a dog lover. And as I was approaching this fruit stand, there was a dog uh, walking towards me past the owner. He sort of, the dog sort of looked like a uh, wine reiner, though not quite as well kept. And he was walking in a jaunty way, taking a stroll. And as that dog passed that stack of bones, he, without missing a beat of walking, turned his head and bit into an entire bag of bones and kept walking. The bag of bones was hanging out of both sides of his mouth and he was holding it like this and he didn't start running. He just kept walking as if he had done nothing wrong at all and all of the people that were walking around me that were facing the dog and had witnessed this, we all started howling as the dog wove through us uh, with his bag of bones. I couldn't resist figuring out where this story was gonna go next. So I turned around and followed the dog. 
and about a block and a half later, there was a long, narrow alley on the right side, and the dog turned in it. I looked down the alley, expecting to see him sitting down and having his first bone of the day, and what did I see? I saw him take off running to the other end of the alley where three dogs were anxiously waiting for him to arrive with breakfast. And they were all barking and they were so happy. I think it was one of my favorite parts of the trip because it connected me with humanity. All of a sudden, all these people that I was strangers from before, everyone who was walking and minding their own business, we came together in this moment of joy to watch the simplest, the silliest thing. But in that moment, we connected. It was even more special to me than the ancient church I had visited. Because after all, isn't that connection, isn't that what we are really all about? In that church, I was alone, but on the street, laughing in joy with a bunch of strangers, I was connected. I was connected to humanity in a way I have often felt in the very best moments of being the church. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, we are reminded of the ways that God shows up in times like this. May these words stir our souls to continue to care for the mustard tree that is our faith, our church, and to call to mind that the church never was about a building. It has always been about people loving one another in the name of the one who never has and never will stop loving us. From the book of Isaiah, chapter 51. Listen to me, all you that pursue righteousness. I love you that seek the author of life. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who writhed in labor for you all. He was just one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the God who saves has comforted Zion. She has comforted all her waste places, and she shall make her wilderness like Eden, her desert, like the garden of the creator of all. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the sound of song. Sorrow and mourning will flee away. Listen to me, my people and my nation, to me give heed. For a teaching shall from me go forth and my justice for a light to all the people.